Did I? Okay, good, it's on. Esther chapter 2, and we're going to be spending our time in this part of our day together in the book of Esther. Good to see everyone this morning. I had a really strange dream that uh, it, it snowed, and there was ice, and the schools were closed, and all that happened, and then I woke up, and it was 60-something degrees and kind of rainy. It feels like spring. So I guess it was just a strange dream. I don't know. I don't know if you guys have ever had anything like that happen, but uh, it is. Uh, it's an interesting thing to see uh, the changes in the weather and everything. I'm glad to. Uh, we've had uh, we've had some problems with some uh, who are related to some of us with the weather, and uh, but we're thankful that we're all able to survive all of that and be together again today. Uh, Esther chapter two. <clears throat> I want to begin by pointing out something that is a very strange fact. That is, Esther is the only book in the Bible that does not mention God. Now, you might be thinking there is another book that's close. It's the book, the Song of Solomon. But actually, at one little part in the Song of Solomon, there appears to be the word Yah, which is the, an abbreviated form of the name of God. But let, let's just go back a minute. I, I just said there's a book in the Bible that doesn't mention God in any way. And the question that I want to ask this morning is, why? Why doesn't Esther mention God? By the way, we're all going to be on this side, because this side is not working. So I was thinking about it, and that means that this morning we're going to be a left-leaning congregation. Let's go to that, side. that was a joke, by the way. So <laughs> Esther doesn't mention God, and the question is why. The answer that I'm going to pursue for a few minutes this morning as we look through the text of Esther and we kind of go through the story, I, I want to... State at the beginning, though, Esther doesn't not mention God because there aren't any opportunities. There are a lot of opportunities in the book where the name of God or the work of God could easily be brought up. And I'll point that out as we go through. But it's just, it's notably absent. Not saying anything about God. And Esther, that, that lack of mentioning God is also not because Esther is just some sort of strange outlier, different kind of style than the rest of the Old Testament. That's not necessarily true. There are a lot of biblical themes in Esther and a lot of the things that, that will relate to other parts of the Old Testament. But just for some reason, God's not in there. And that's an important idea. So what I want to do is just kind of go through the text of the book. We're not going to read it all, but we're going to read bits and pieces, especially the bits and pieces that to me seem relevant to the question of why Esther doesn't mention God. So, uh, just to get a little, uh, get our feet wet in the context of the book, uh, Esther takes place in the Persian capital of Susa. You remember Judah is taken into Babylonian captivity, and then the Persians take over Babylon, and so Israel, Judah is suddenly in Persian captivity. Some are sent back by Cyrus. Uh, that's the beginning of the book of Ezra to rebuild the temple. And some years later, we have a new king. It's the king Xerxes, or in the text, his, his name is Ahasuerus, which I'm never sure exactly how to say. Uh, and he is going to be sort of the main king figure in, in Esther. But the story follows a Jew named Mordecai and his niece, Esther. And Esther is going to reach an elevated place in the kingdom, and we're going to talk about what happens after she does that. So uh, the book begins in chapter 1 with the king having a party. And he calls his wife so that basically he and all his noble friends can gawk at her. And she doesn't come. She says no. And so then they have this big cabinet meeting where they decide, what are we going to do? The king's wife told him no. Okay, so what are we going to do? And they decide, well, we're going to get a new queen. Vashti is out. And we need a new queen. So uh, Esther 2 and verse 5. Esther 2 and verse 5. Now there was a Jew in Susa the citadel whose name was Mordecai, son of Jair, son of Shemaiah, son of Kish, a Benjaminite, who had been carried away from Jerusalem among the captives, carried away with Jeconiah, king of Judah, whom Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, had carried away. He was bringing up Hadassah, that is Esther, the daughter of his uncle, for she had neither father nor mother. The young woman had a beautiful figure and was lovely to look at. When her father and her mother died, Mordecai took her as his own daughter. So when the king's order and the edict were proclaimed, when many young, people, young women were gathered in Susa, the citadel, in custody of Haggai, <laughs> Esther also was taken into the king's palace and put in custody of Haggai, who had charge of the women. And the young woman pleased him and won his favor. And he quickly provided her with, her with her cosmetics and her portion of food and with seven chosen young women from the king's palace and advanced her and her young women to the best place in the harem. Esther had not made known her people or kindred, for Mordecai had commanded her not to make it known. 
And every day Mordecai walked in front of the court of the harem to learn how Esther was and what was happening to her. So I want to begin by just pointing out some of the many coincidences of the book of Esther. It just so happens that the queen is deposed and we need a new queen. And at that time, there just happens to be, just happens, just coincidentally, Esther is there in the right place at the right time. She happens to be a beautiful woman. She happens to be of the right age to be someone that the king would be interested in. She happens to have a wise uncle who tells her, don't mention that you're a Jew. That's going to be very important later in the story. And all of this just happens to happen the way it happens. So I just want you to get the feel of that. I'm going to be saying that a lot as we go through the book of Esther because there are a lot of so-called coincidences in the book of Esther. In verse 15, Esther 2 and verse 15, it says, When the term came for Esther, the daughter of Abihel, the uncle of Mordecai, who had taken her as his own daughter to go into the king, she asked for nothing except what Haggai the king's eunuch, who had charge of the women, advised. Now Esther was winning favor in the eyes of all who saw her. And when Esther was taken to King Asuerus into his royal palace in the tenth month, which is the month of Teba, in the seventh year of his reign, the king loved Esther more than all the women, and she won grace and favor in his sight more than all the virgins, so that he set, her royal, set the royal crown on her head and made her queen instead of Vashti. So Esther is winning favor in the eyes of all around her. She won grace and favor in the eyes of the king. Does that sound familiar to you? It should sound familiar to you because it is almost exactly the wording that is used of Joseph when Joseph goes down to Egypt and he begins to gain favor in the eyes of Potiphar. Okay, it says in Genesis 39, verse 3, his master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord caused all that he did to succeed in his hands. So Joseph found favor in his sight and attended him. He made him overseer of his house and put him in charge of all that he had. Notice the difference, though. What, what's mentioned in Joseph's account that's not mentioned in Esther? The Lord. The Lord was with him. But see, we don't see anything like that in Esther. Instead, it's just... Everybody loves Esther. Esther's getting favor in everyone's eyes, favor in the eye of the, the eunuch who's over the harem, favor in the eye of the king, and, and over and over again. Well, well, it just so happens that she happens to be the one who is named queen. Something else just so happens, by the way, in the beginning of the story, verse 21 of chapter 2. Chapter 2, verse 21. In those days, as Mordecai was sitting at the king's gate, Big Than and Teresh, two of the king's eunuchs who guarded the threshold, became angry and sought to lay hands on King Ahasuerus. And this came to the knowledge of Mordecai, and he told it to Queen Esther. And Esther told the king in the name of Mordecai. When the affair was investigated and found to be so, then both men were hanged on the gallows, and it was recorded in the book of the Chronicles in the presence of the king. I want you to notice that language in verse 22. This came to the knowledge of Mordecai. Isn't that an interesting phrase? It just came to the knowledge. We don't even know where it came from. We don't know if somebody told him. We don't know if he overheard it. But that's not really important. What's important is, well, Mordecai learned something that's going to be really important later on. So stick that in your mind. That's going to come back up later on. All right, chapter 3, we meet our villain. By the way, poor Tuck. Uh, Tuck asked me, what, what am I going to preach about in this, this session? Because he wanted to lead songs that related to it. And I said, Esther. Okay, and so he, he led all the Esther songs in our book this morning. Um, I, I told him there had to be one about that wicked Haman, uh, but we just don't seem to sing about that. Not sure why. And, uh, but here is, here is our villain introduced to us, Esther 3 and verse 1. After these things, King Ahasuerus promoted Haman the Agagite, the son of Hamadatha, and advanced him and set, him on his, set his throne above all the officials who were with him. And all the king's servants who were at the king's gate bowed down and paid homage to Haman, for the king had so commanded concerning him. But Mordecai did not bow down or pay homage. Then the king's servants who were at the king's gate said to Mordecai, Why do you transgress the king's command? And when they spoke to him day after day that he would not listen to them, they told Haman in order to see whether Mordecai's words would stand, for he had told them that he was a Jew. And when Haman saw that Mordecai did not bow down or pay homage to him, Haman was filled with fury. But he disdained to lay hands on Mordecai alone. So, as they had made known to him the people of Mordecai, Haman sought to destroy all the Jews, the people of Mordecai, throughout the whole kingdom of Ahasuerus. So Haman is a guy, as we'll learn, who has an ego as big as it could possibly be. And he decides that if this guy is not going to bow down to him, then he's just going to not just kill him, but destroy all his people. I want you to notice, though, there's something important here in how this conversation unfolds. Because it says in verse 2 that, that Haman would not bow down or pay, I mean, Mordecai would not bow down or pay homage. And so they ask him in verse 3, why not? But we don't get Haman, uh, Mordecai's answer. We don't get it. All we see in verse 4 is that he told them that he was a Jew. 
Okay? So, how do you think that conversation went? Mordecai, why won't you bow down? I'm a Jew. And? Okay, well, what, what does that imply? It implies, because I'm a Jew, I bow down only to God. But you notice that's not mentioned in the text. There's nothing there about it would be some kind of violation of my God. I'm not going to bow down. Nothing like that. No, instead, it just says he said he was a Jew. As if that has special significance. So, again, we have a, a place where God could be mentioned. And he's not. So, I, I want you to keep adding these up because it seems notable to me that God is not mentioned when he very well could be. Uh, verse 8 of chapter 3, Haman goes before the king. Haman says to King Ahasuerus, There's a certain people scattered abroad, dispersed among the peoples in all the provinces of your kingdom. The, their laws are different from those of every other people, and they do not keep the king's laws so that it is not the king's, to the king's profit to tolerate them. So he convinces the king to um, finance the extermination of the Jewish people. But I want you to notice, Haman's argument is, they're different. How are they different? How are the Jews different from all other peoples? Why are their laws so different? There's a reason. It has to do with God. It has to do with their worship of one God and the laws that that God has given them. But again, that's not mentioned. It's not specific here in Haman's denunciation of Mordecai. So, chapter 4, after this edict to exterminate the Jews is known, and you've got to remember, if we're reading this as Jews, this is a terrifying thing. We're already a people who are captive in a foreign land, and now the most powerful people in the world have said, we're going to kill all the Jews. So... This is a proper response, chapter 4 and verse 1. When Mordecai learned all that had been done, Mordecai tore his clothes and put on sackcloth and ashes and went out into the midst of the city, and he cried out with a loud and bitter cry. He went up to the entrance of the king's gate, for no one was allowed to enter the king's gate clothed in sackcloth. And in every province, wherever the king's command and his decree reached, there was great mourning among the Jews with fasting and weeping and lamenting, and many of them lay in sackcloth and ashes. So Mordecai and the other Jews, they do what is a typical Jewish mourning, Okay, they t put on sackcloth and ashes, and they weep and lament, and they fast. They fast. Notice, though, what, what's missing from the typical Jewish lament? There is no prayer. Because if we talk about prayer, we're talking about God. Okay, so that is studiously omitted in the text. We're not going to talk about prayer. In fact, I want you to notice that in chapter 4. This is the crisis moment of the book, chapter 4. And in that crisis moment, it is specifically said, specifically omitted that they did not pray, even though they need God's help and they're reaching out to God. But again, why would, why would they fast? Fasting is the idea of abstaining from something in order to appeal to God in the Old Testament. And you don't have any reference to God. Instead, they just fast as if somehow this is a, an expression of grief instead of an expression of, of uh, reaching out to God. Chapter uh, 4 and verse 8, uh, Mordecai begins to talk to Esther and give Esther the information, as Esther is now queen, of course. Chapter 4 and verse 8, Mordecai also gave him a copy of the written decree issued in Susa for their destruction, that he might show it to Esther and explain it to her and command her to go to the king to beg his favor and plead with him on behalf of her people. And Hathak went and told Esther what Mordecai had said. Then Esther spoke to Hathak and commanded him to go to Mordecai and say, all the king's servants and the people of the king's provinces know that if any man or woman goes to the king inside the inner court without being called, there is but one law to be put to death, except the one to whom the king holds out the golden scepter so that he may live. But as for me, I have not been called to come into the king these 30 days. So here's what's happening. Mordecai says, well, the only hope we have is we have somebody who knows the king and he, she has favor in the sight of the king and everybody. So let's ask her to go into the king and talk to him. And Esther says... Uh, there's a problem, which is, if you go to the king when he hasn't called you, you die. Unless the king happens to pardon you. But the king hasn't called for me for a month. So she is saying, uh, this is not going to work. It's not like I'm just sitting here next to the king and say, hey, look at this letter I got. It's something instead that's going to risk my life if I do that. Now, Esther then needs some kind of intervention. Hmm. I wonder what that typically would be in the Bible. Any ideas? Maybe God, right? Somebody who would help this situation improve. So Mordecai doesn't seem very sympathetic to Esther's concern, if you ask me. Look at verse 12. Uh, they told Mordecai what Esther had said, and Mordecai told them to reply to Esther, Do not think to yourself that in the king's palace you will escape any more than all the other Jews. So remember that. Uh, Esther 
is in the king's palace, but nobody knows she's a Jew. So he's saying, don't think you're going to escape just because nobody knows. Verse 14, for if you keep silent at this time, relief and deliverance will rise for the Jews from another place, but you and your father's house will perish. And who knows whether you have not come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Then Esther told them to reply to Mordecai, go gather all the Jews to be found in Susa and hold a fast on my behalf. And do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and my young women will also fast as you do. Then I will go to the king, though it is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. Mordecai then went away and did everything as Esther had ordered him. So Mordecai says, don't think you'll escape. You'll find judgment. And uh, verse 14 is a key here. For if you keep silent at this time, relief and deliverance will rise from the Jew, for the Jews from another place. But you and your father's house will perish. So Mordecai is confident. Number one... If you let God's people die, or if you let the Jews die, then something bad is going to happen to you. And something good is going to happen to them. Relief and deliverance will arise from another place. You see how vague that is? Somehow, something's going to work out so that God's people are spared. I'm sorry, the Jews are spared. You know, it's almost as if we're cutting out the God part deliberately. But it's clear that Mordecai believes there is some force or power that's going to bring justice. And he's going to save. And he's going to judge those who are unwilling to help those who are in desperate need. So you and your father's house will perish. So Esther makes a decision, and she asks for all the Jews to fast. Okay? Now, if there is no God... And they're all just on their own. What good is fasting going to do? Oh, it's going to make them a little skinnier. That's about it. Okay, but she is asking everybody to fast, to join together in some kind of communal appeal to God. But again, the God part is left off. And there is also no account of, isn't this a perfect moment for prayer? Okay, even like in Nehemiah, when Nehemiah goes before the king, and he's, he's praying before, and he's praying while he's before the king. Okay, that's more typical of what we see in the Old Testament. But instead you have this notably absent appeal to God. So, Esther asks and goes in, and the king is willing to receive her in chapter 5. But I love Esther's courage. If I perish, I perish. Because she is trusting that something's going to work out. Hmm, I wonder what that could be. wonder why. You see it? Over and over again, these coincidences and these assumptions that things are just going to go well. So Esther decides that she's going to talk to the king and to Haman alone. And she does that in chapter 5. And it's kind of a two-step thing. She has a banquet to invite them to another banquet, which I've always thought was kind of strange. But Haman is super excited because, hey, great news. I already had a banquet with the king and the queen, and I get another one. So... He's doing great. Chapter 5 and verse 9. Haman went out that day joyful and glad of heart. But when Haman saw Mordecai in the king's gate, that he neither rose nor trembled before him, he was filled with wrath against Mordecai. So here is this Jew. He, he's not rising, nor is he trembling before me. And so that just ruins Haman's day. And so Haman goes home, and his wife talks to him and says, Why don't you build a big gallows to hang somebody? And he feels a lot better after that. Oh, good. We got, it. we got us a nice gallows. It won't be long now. I'm going to put Mordecai on the gallows. Now, now we begin a cascading series of coincidences. Chapter 6 and verse 1, the king can't sleep. Chapter 6 and verse 1. So he asks them to come bring the chronicles. Come read the old news. Okay, so that maybe I can fall asleep. And guess what's in the old news? About Mordecai. Just so happens that they read about Mordecai uncovering the plot. Hmm. Just so happens that the king asks, did anything happen for Mordecai? And they say, no, no, nobody ever honored him. Just so happens that Haman is right outside because he is there to come ask for the king to give him Mordecai to hang on his brand new gallows. Just so happens that the king says, hey, Mor uh, Haman, what do you think we should do if I want to honor somebody? And, ha and Mordecai, uh, Haman, I get the names mixed up. Haman has this long list of things. Oh, you should do this, this, and this. And he says, okay, go do that for Mordecai. And so Haman has to walk around the city praising Mordecai. Okay, remember, this is the guy he wanted to kill. And so he goes home ashamed 
And I want you to notice one thing that is said here in chapter 6 and verse 13. Haman told his wife Zeresh and all his friends everything that had happened to him. Then his wise men and his wife Zeresh said to him, If Mordecai, before whom you have begun to fall, is of the Jewish people, you will not overcome him, but will surely fall before him. wonder why. Is there some innate power in being Jewish? No, there's a hint here that there's something special about these people. They don't keep the laws, they don't bow, and yet they seem to be protected. And if you try to go after them, it doesn't go well for you. Relief and deliverance arises from a different source. So, chapter 7, uh, Esther has this second banquet with uh, the king and with Haman. And she reveals that Haman is the source of this conspiracy to destroy the Jews. And the king is angry. And it just so happens that the king is so angry he goes outside. And Haman begins to beg for his life from the queen, from Esther. And it, the king walks back in in one of those looks worse than it really is situations. And he thinks that, the, that Haman is assaulting Queen Esther. And so immediately the bag goes over his head. They take him out to the gallows. He prepares for Haman and I'm um, prepared for Mordecai. And Haman is killed on his own gallows. So there's a, there's a bitter irony there for Haman. Now that, that would be the end of the story, except there's still this edict out there that the Jews are all going to be annihilated. And so uh, there is... Uh, a turn now where Mordecai has favor in the eyes of the king. Chapter 8 and verse 15. Chapter 8 and verse 15. And Mordecai went out from the presence of the king in royal robes of blue and white, with a great golden crown and a robe of fine linen and purple. And the city of Susa shouted and rejoiced. The Jews had light and gladness and joy and honor. And in every province and in every city, wherever the king's command and his edict reached, there was gladness and joy among the Jews, a feast and a holiday. And many from the peoples of the country declared themselves Jews, for fear of the Jews had fallen on them. Chapter 9, verse 1. Now in the twelfth month, which is in the month of Adar, and the thirteenth day of the same, when the king's command and edict were about to be carried out, on the very day when the enemies of the Jews hoped to gain the mastery over them, the reverse occurred. The Jews gained mastery over those who hated them. So the tables turn, and the question is left there hanging who turned the tables? And so, the Jews did get relief and deliverance. And it happened through Esther and through what, according to the text, appears to be a series of coincidences. So they celebrate a feast and they inaugurate the Feast of Purim or Purim uh, here in the book of Esther. And it's a, the story about how they were delivered from this opposition from the king of Persia. So, I do believe there's a lot to learn from the book of Esther. I, I believe there's something here about what we do when we reach the limits of our control and our power, because that's, they certainly did. There were things that were beyond their control. Uh, how do people of faith respond to adversity? You see a lot of that. Uh, and opposition, especially hostile opposition uh, from Mordecai, from Haman. Uh, it, it impresses me with the question, how many Unique single things have to go right before I can receive a blessing. Like how many things go into a blessing? It's really unique in that way. But I asked the question, why doesn't Esther mention God? And here is the answer that's the best I can do. Okay, so this is the best I can do. If you don't agree, that's okay. You can come teach about why you think Esther doesn't mention God. But not right now because we only have six minutes. I believe Esther emphasizes God by understatement. There are so many things in the text that point to God or imply God. How many coincidences could there possibly be? Because this is a whole lot of coincidences. Things that just had to be just so. Or, or the question of why would they fast, like I asked a minute ago. How did everybody like Esther all the time? Everybody. How can the Jewish people survive when the king demands their destruction? If there is no God... If God is not involved in the story at all, then this is a really, really strange set of coincidences. So the word that we use to describe this, where God is emphasized by not being emphasized, is the word providence. Which I like to think of as God at work without signing his work. God doesn't tell us, I did that. That's different. When God says, I was behind that. But when God does work, and yet doesn't declare that was me. So, I think that's one of the reasons the book of Esther feels particularly helpful to me. 
Because in the book of Esther, you don't have the direct signs. You don't have God speaking through a burning bush. You don't have the miracles that we see in other parts of the Bible. In fact, you don't have a word from God at all in the book of Esther. No prophets, nothing like that. So, the question then comes, well, how else could this happen? Without any direct intervention from God. And what I really want us to see from this is that just because God's not mentioned doesn't mean God's not at work. I want you to look again in chapter 4 with me. Esther chapter 4. This is what Mordecai says, and I believe this is what we're intended to take as sort of the the theological stance of the book. Uh, Because certainly Mordecai is the hero and Haman is the villain. And the worldviews they represent, one wins and one loses. Esther chapter 4 and verse 14. Mordecai says, For if you keep silent at this time, relief and deliverance will rise for the Jews from another place, but you and your father's house will perish. And who knows whether you have not come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Mordecai suggests that there is someone or something behind it all. A purpose. That that maybe the whole situation has been leading to this moment. Maybe all of this stuff about you know, everything that happened to your parents and, and me being somewhere here close to the palace but not quite in the palace and, and all of this about Haman and all of this leading to this point where you have a chance, Esther, to change the fate of your people forever. Maybe, who knows, whether God has been behind this all the time. And I really love this because I believe this is helpful. I believe it's helpful for you and me when we need the courage to do something hard that we know is God's will, it can really help us to open our eyes to the possibility that this may be the reason we're in this situation. Just like Esther. Maybe the reason I'm here, maybe the reason I live in this town, maybe the reason I have this friend, maybe the reason they asked me this question, maybe the reason I'm here now is for this moment. Because if that's the case, then then I definitely want to do what God has put me in position to do. I want to say what needs to be said. I want to help who I can help. I want to teach who I can teach. Because if this is what God's been doing with my life, then I catch a glimpse of the work of God. And and Mordecai inspires Esther with those very thoughts. This may be what this was all about. Surely Esther had wondered, you know, is there a point to my life? Is there a purpose here? And Mordecai says, maybe the purpose is this moment, for such a time as this. And you contrast that with Haman's worldview. Haman's worldview does not have anybody behind it. Haman's worldview is about Haman. And if people are going to bow at Haman, if he can force his will on people, if he can get the king to honor him, if he can maneuver his way up the ladder, if he can destroy the people who don't bow, then he is going to do whatever he can get away with. That's Haman's world. And what happens to Haman? doesn't go well for him because Haman runs into a power he could not control. So, I believe Esther not mentioning God invites you and me into the story and says to you and me, well, why do you think this happened? Well, what do you think was going on here with the Jews and the Persians and with what happened with God's people in a desperate moment? But I think what's particularly helpful, and the reason that I wanted to talk about this, is when we turn to our own lives. Because there are similar questions we can ask. How many of these kinds of situations do we have? Situations where we face threats and dangers, or where we see opportunities, or where we gain favor in the the eyes of other people? We may not see miracles. We may not see burning bushes or have direct word from the Lord. But can we see God at work the way we see God at work in Esther's time? God at work without signing his word. So, for example, can can you tell when God is blessing people? Can you see when your brothers and sisters are growing? I mean, it's easy when you when you look at children physically growing and you you know, well. Sometimes you see them once a week, and every time you see them, they seem to get bigger. Okay, but but can we tell when people are growing spiritually? Can we see God at work in their lives? Can we see God answering prayers? 
I tell you, I'm bad about this. I'll pray and pray and pray, and then I get what I've asked for, and I completely forget that I even asked for it. Can we see that that's God? Or that God is at work opening doors? God is at work healing bodies? God is at work giving favor? God is at work moving mountains? Esther reminds us of the possibility that when we think God might be at work, it gives us courage to do hard things. It gives us courage to do what we know we need to do because we're not alone. And perhaps this is what the whole life has been about for such a time as this, for a moment like this. And then when we do receive the blessings from God, it gives tremendous fuel for gratitude, just like these people who begin to hold a festival just to remember things were so desperate and God spared us, God saved us. Now, I understand that providence and the idea of understating God, that's a challenge for us because we don't want to attribute to God something that, that might be not directly his responsibility. We don't want to falsely assign God things and motives and actions. But when we see God's will done, we can safely assume that God is behind it. And I encourage you to look at your life and the way your life has unfolded and then the challenges that lie in front of you. And ask the question, is God at work here? Because that's the question that I think Esther invites us to do. So look for God at work, even if he doesn't sign his word. That's what I believe is the answer to the question, why Esther doesn't mention God. All right. I think we're out of time, aren't we? Well, thank you so much for your attention. We'll be dismissed for our classes.